All right, awesome. Um, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure being here. I've actually, I think it's my third gig in this venue. I spoke at Droidcon before, and it's really awesome to be here at API Days. Since nowadays there's this talk where people say we are living in an API-driven community, in an API-driven web. Companies are obviously having business models completely driven by APIs. Uh, I think PayPal would be one of the best examples of actually having that. And we're slowly approaching, obviously, the next big phase where we think about how do we actually apply those APIs that we consume on a daily basis, and how do we apply those products that we consume on a daily basis beyond the web and beyond mobile? How do we go the next step? What's the next big thing? So we already heard Orange uh, just a few seconds ago, actually, with Patrice, and he enlightened us and said, well, IoT is obviously one of the big things that we have to look out for, and that's where I'm going to tap into. Um, personally, I'm uh, the head of developer advocacy at PayPal and Braintree. You heard Tony Blank from Context.io yesterday and Mike uh, Swift, uh, sorry, just Swift from MLH yesterday talking about evangelism. So um, I think the role that my team and other evangelism teams actually have is making sure that we make developers' life easier. That whenever you want to work with our products, whenever you try to actually interact with our companies, you have a satisfying experience, but also that we know what's going on and that we can contribute and educate, that we help with thought leadership. And that's where my team comes in. Um, so we do that in uh, Berlin, in London, in Madrid. That's where our evangelists live in Europe. But also, obviously, in America, we do that in Asia. And I'm incredibly happy to be here. Let's see if that actually works. It does. OK. So um, originally, I'm from Berlin, which is a beautiful city. If you've not been there, you should totally go there. It's always worth a trip. It doesn't always look as beautiful as this. Right now, it's raining and about zero degrees, so even worse than here right now. Um, but since I'm a developer advocate, most of the time I'm actually living at Berlin Tegel in one of those nice Berlin airplanes. And uh, we basically travel from event to event, from company to company, from country to country to do these kind of things. And I'm not sure if you actually know the background of PayPal, but in 2009, there was this thing they called PayPal X Developer Network. And they were actually the first banking company, the first company in finance to open up their APIs to developers. So we obviously do have a deep interest in working with developers and understanding what they need, how their life easier. Again, this is our key statement. So I'm not quite sure if you heard about this story, but they actually got funded in 98 as a totally different company called Confinity where a few really unknown guys like Peter Thiel and Max Lefshin came together and they decided to run a payments company for PDAs. So we talk about smart objects already. So they used infrared for payments and if you have ever dealt with a Palm Pre or some of the other devices that used to exist, you know how reliable infrared was. So probably not the best idea. Well, then in uh, one, uh, I think in actually 99, they got acquired by another company called X.com. And X.com was a company by Elon Musk. So if you heard about Tesla, if you heard about SpaceX, that's exactly the same guy. Then they renamed uh, the whole thing into PayPal in 2001. And after their IPO, they got acquired by eBay. Now, I do work for Braintree, which is a company that got acquired by PayPal end of 2013. And if you look at Venmo, which is another uh, credit card processing company, they got acquired by uh, Braintree in 2012. So it's a very complex mixture of different companies that acquired each other. Now, the specialty of Braintree is that we try to be very agnostic in terms of te the technology. So we don't really care what the uh, user wants to accept as long as we can offer that. So one example would be Coinbase integration for Bitcoin. We think obviously Bitcoin is a thing and people should be able to pay with it if they choose to. Um, so I think as a payment service provider or as a service provider in general, 
every company should always try to offer the solutions that the users want and not just that the companies want to push for the sake of having revenue and a business model. Then also um, we adopted actually to Apple Pay fairly quick. One of our biggest customers, Uber, is actually using Apple Pay with us. And we don't quite know what the future brings, right? Um, I saw Christian Heimann just a few weeks ago in Madrid, and he said, we're actually really bad at predicting the future, and I absolutely agree, because we can try to understand what's going on, and based on our current experience and what happened in the past, we can try to predict what's coming up, but we never really know if that's really true or not until it really happens. So we tried to abstract our technology stack in uh, such a way that whenever something new comes up, we can add that technology as soon and as quick as possible. So when we look at technology, there are actually three key requirements that we all have to adhere to and that also are going to apply to IoT. Because obviously we want to make sure that our users have a great experience with our services, that they like to come back, because that is what eventually is going to earn us money. And I think it makes sense and it's very sensible to start with security. We already heard, again, privacy is a big thing. I'm coming from Germany, so privacy is basically what I'm living for. At least that's what they pretend. <laughs> and Security is really important, obviously, so if we deal with any services, if we transmit data, we obviously want to make sure that nobody does a man-in-the-middle attack. Um, I speak a lot at JavaScript conferences, and obviously over there they deal with C-surf attacks and cross-site scripting and so on. So we found actually ways to harden the web to make sure that it's getting harder and harder to access data that you shouldn't be able to access. Um, if you've walked around at the sponsor booths upstairs, uh, which is actually a really cool area, you see that there's actually one of the booths in the uh, first room that uh, talks about access management for smart devices. So we actually need to start thinking about access management, access levels, uh, which we do have for APIs. And now that we approach the world of smart locks uh, that help us secure our doors and so on, we obviously need to start thinking about having different tokens that provide access to our uh, home, to our coffee machine, to our fridge, and so on. Well, then we need to be able to uh, be very flexible because obviously the base of our products is changing constantly. As in technology, uh, IoT moves incredibly fast. If you look at the web, we used to have Ruby on Rails as one of the big things. Nowadays, people talk about Node.js. The next big thing is probably closure or something else. We can't really tell. So we have to be able to be, again, incredibly agnostic in terms of what we deal with. We have to be opening up our services to these things. And that's where, obviously, a good API comes in. So we don't just offer the SDK for the platforms. We also offer the API that allows to adopt new platforms in a nice and clean way. And then, obviously, we have to talk about scalability. So in payments, our example would be, we should be able to work with a small startup that just got created and earns their first dollar, up to big airlines that drive millions of uh, dollars of revenue every month. Services that we work with should be able to scale, and obviously the services that you work with should be able to scale. And that's where IoT is actually getting more and more interesting because some of the devices that I'm going to talk about actually tap heavily into the cloud. They don't really need you to synchronize different services, so we don't need to think about parallel computing. Lots of the stuff that we had to do ourselves a few years ago basically come for free nowadays. I think it's never been easier for developers to develop great experiences than nowadays. So if we look at the current technology landscape, we actually see a few dominating experiences, especially in IoT, and those are really fantastic. I'll talk about them in a second. So, obviously, since I'm coming from payments, I like to go into the view world to see what's going on. And every now and then, I'm actually at home, and I need to buy some food. So I go to a supermarket, and that's what I'm facing. It is full, it is packed, I have to queue up, I might not be able to pay with my favorite credit card. Nobody knows me. I don't know where to find the product that I'm looking for. Maybe I don't know which product I'm looking for. 
there is no shop assistant around, somebody is smelling, I want to be at home. So obviously there are a lot of these factors that play in that we are actually really desiring. So everybody loves the online shopping experience where you go to a store, you enter what you want, you click on buy and a few days after you get the whole package at home from a nice delivery guy or not. And that's obviously a great experience. That's something that we should all try to desire. But how do we bring this experience to the offline space? Where do we actually tap into? Which technology can we leverage? Well, right now, the one big answer seems to be to uh, run away <laughs> or start using Bluetooth Low Energy. So we all realized that QR codes are horrible. QR codes are really not fun because you need to take out your phone, you have bad lightning, you try to autofocus the QR code, and eventually the QR code scans or not. The more information you have in the QR code, the longer the process takes, and that can be a very frustrating experience. And whenever the users get frustrated, they run away, they don't enjoy your experience anymore. So Bluetooth Low Energy, Bluetooth 4, came up and they actually solved a lot of the pay points that people had with Bluetooth. Because Bluetooth used to be very error prone, it used to be famous for high energy consumption, and they actually solved a lot of these problems. Now LE, low energy, or some people actually know it as Bluetooth Smart, is known for uh, being able to transmit lots of tiny uh, chunks of data. It's not really great to submit uh, big, huge chunks of data though. So it's not really great for submitting files, but it's amazing for push notifications, for broadcasts. And that's where people actually start using that. So if you come into a store, if you come into a coffee shop, you should be able to actually get an automatic push, take out your phone and order your coffee. Or even if you're close by, you should be able to order your coffee. And once you arrive at that coffee shop, it should be standing there right for you, ready to pick up. So if we look at the differences between the, uh, Bluetooth Low Energy and regular Bluetooth, the like versions 2 and below that, we actually see a few big differences. The first one already mentioned was the battery consumption. There uh, is a blog post by Node Agency, and they actually say it's up to a factor of 100. I'm not quite sure if that's entirely true, because obviously different kind of data packages need to be adhered to. But let's assume it's much lower. Now the latency is much lower as well because we actually don't need to couple our devices. We don't start doing the whole Bluetooth pairing request thing and then entering a four-digit pin and then finally getting, being able to send data. And the range on Bluetooth LE is very low compared to the other one, actually by the factor two, for the very simple reason that if I want to uh, come into a store, I don't want to get all the other push notifications around me as well. So if you've ever dealt with Bluetooth LE, you might have heard about ST mode. I think they're really awesome. They offer nice SDKs, really cool to work with. And they take the IoT approach obviously very, very, uh, I think, serious. And that's obviously something that we all should do, right? Now, when we look at some of our customers, I actually noticed that lots of them try to move the payments experience in the background. So one of the popular examples, Midi already mentioned it actually during his opening speech, was Uberizing companies, moving experiences that really touch us all and actually don't hurt us by having great user experience. So if we look at Uber, fantastic example. This morning, I did the checkout at my hotel. I uh, ordered my Uber, I did the whole checkout, waited for two minutes, stepped into my nice car, drove here, got out, and as soon as I connected to the conference Wi-Fi, I had an email saying I just paid. I didn't really have to speak any French in order to order my cab. I didn't have to explain where I want to go. I didn't have to discuss about tip, and I didn't have to have any cash. That's an experience that obviously really matters, and that's really fantastic. So experiences like Uber, where people suddenly actually start enjoying paying, is something that uh, we will see more and more within the next few years, where the magic moment, the hero moment is going to happen, and suddenly something that is actually really painful, like paying and losing money, is becoming fun. 
Now, we've already heard variables uh, as one of the big buzzwords being thrown into the room, right? Because variables are fantastic. I'm wearing a Motorola smartwatch over here. I also have one of those uh, Withings Pulse devices. I have a smart scale at home. So like the whole quantified self-movement is obviously really important. And then there is this one big other thing called biometrics, where we start discussing if a fingerprint can actually be our token that secures connections, that identifies users. And as soon as we start talking about biometry, we actually run into a few key issues where we see uh, issues like, what if somebody shops off my finger? So we have 10 identities on our hands, right? Do we really want to lose all those 10? Or should we say, my finger says, I'm Tim, and then I still have another token really authenticating and authorizing my requests? So we tap into this area, and people are trying out different approaches. Uh, one really cool approach would be the NIMI, which is a bracelet by a company out of Toronto called Bionim. And they actually use the heartbeat as an identifier. So they start actually uh, recognizing different patterns. And they don't really differ if I run or if I move or if I sleep. There are certain patterns that are always the same. So we can start recognizing our users and uh, like enhancing their experiences. So we don't really need to ask them for passwords anymore, which is fantastic. So we leverage all those devices. We create a trusted environment. And actually, Google in Android 5, they actually uh, brought this feature into the OS. So if you have your Android smartphone and you have your Google Glass connected, if you're one of the lucky ones who has one, um, you actually don't have to enter your PIN anymore or your password anymore if you want to. Those experiences are really fantastic. They are really delightful. And there was this one uh, quote in Smashing Magazine for web developers that says, if you favor security too much uh, over the user experience, you make the whole experience a pain to use. Well, we can actually apply the same to IoT, to smart objects and smart devices. We can leverage a lot of different other form factors, devices around us, uh, without really asking for any input. We already learned today that the smartphone is becoming the hub for our central life, for our connected life. So can we use other connections, other applications? I think we can. So there is this one research company out of the US called Gartner. And whatever Gartner says is true. <laughs> And they came up with this thing called the hype cycle, and they analyzed the technology landscape to uh, predict new coming things and say how successful they are or not. And that is f packed with lots of technology. But if we look at the hype cycle, you will actually see that the Internet of Things is on this hype cycle, and it's actually at the biggest part of this cycle, at the biggest momentum it's ever going to get. IoT is there. It's not just something that we all talk about today and in five years you see the first devices. Variable user interfaces, they are actually already going downwards because at some point after the big hype comes the phase of the general acceptance. So variable user interfaces, we already use them. We use fitness bracelets, we use smartwatches, we use glasses, and we're going to use even more within the next few years after we actually realized which form factors work for us and which don't. And then we see NFC, which is a great example. NFC used to be proclaimed being dead, used to be proclaimed being a technology that's not useful. Um, and nowadays, Apple actually used NFC for Apple Pay, and everybody is saying, oh, NFC is fantastic. So obviously, one big company can make a di big difference in the technology acceptance, and that's something that we all have to remember. So Gartner also said, by 2020, we are going to see 26 billion IoT devices, which is an incredibly huge number already. It's very impressive. Now, the issue is, whenever those research companies actually talk, they don't talk to each other. So Intel actually says, by 2020, we are going to have 200 billion smart devices. And it's basically just another research, and the question is obviously what do they define as IoT device versus a smart device. Now, if we look at this, there is a really a cool craft that they provide, and they say in 2006 we only had 6 billion IoT or smart devices, in 2015 it's going to be 15 billion, and then in 2020 we have this huge explosion, and suddenly we have 200 billion of those devices. 
if you actually calculate that down, there would be something like 26 smart devices per human being on Earth. So a lot of uh, different ways to quantify ourselves, I guess. Now, this all leads us to the age of uh, rapid pro uh, prototyping and to an age where we can suddenly start creating amazing both software experiences but also hardware. We live in a world of 3D printers. We can start printing anything that we want. We can even print food nowadays. And obviously, this really helps print, uh, working with different hardware platforms as well. So the movement of open source, Creative Commons licenses and so on was a big major leap into this, a big major step. When we saw open source coming up, um, we actually noticed that open source nowadays is very much accepted within the software community. And we see the same thing happening right now in hardware as well. And that leads us to actually having a new breed of full stack developer. Full stack developers used to be able to adapt to both front end and back end. Nowadays, they can go the extra step. They can actually also add hardware to their capabilities. And if we look at the available hardware that we can all deal with, we see we have Raspberry Pi, which got released in 2012. Who in this room has a Raspberry Pi? Nearly everybody at least saw one, played with one. It's a fantastic device. It powers a full-blown Linux if you want to. It was originally intended for education, but it turned out hackers buy it, so there's no stock left for universities. And they really enjoy playing with it. It's fantastic. I think the experience of actually connecting a light bulb or an LED to it and making it blink the first time is something that changes your life. It's really awesome. Now, there are also obviously Arduinos, and one device I really like is the Arduino Yun, which has a Wi-Fi platform on there already, and the Ethernet plug as well, so you don't need to have an Ethernet or networking sheet in general. And the nice thing is it actually runs a full-blown Linux Yocta, which is a very cool distribution, and that one can also come with OpenWRT. Now, Intel realized IoT is a big thing, so in 2013 they stepped on the train, and they released different boards, the Galileo 1, the Galileo 2, and they are all powered by the Intel Edison. So you see in the upper right corner this tiny ship, which is pretty much what they use as the processing power for the board on the lower left corner. So uh, you see the big device on this uh, screenshot is actually just an extension board. All the power, an Intel ATEM processor, Wi-Fi, GPIO, and so on, is all in the tiny ship. And then there is the Spark Core, which I think is really awesome. And I'm going to talk a bit about the Spark Core. It's pretty much an Arduino certificated device, but it's connected to the cloud already. So you don't need to fiddle around with dynamic IPs and so on. Spark actually provides an API for their Arduino device. Now, the issue with IoT and obviously the device authentication is very simple. We have to deal with different kind of access tokens for our APIs, right? And then we run into two breeds of uh, tokens. We have the regular dynamically generated tokens, and they are fantastic for some use cases. But sometimes we have to deal with non-expiring tokens because we want to install those IoT devices somewhere where it can't just go and then reconnect the whole thing to get a new token and so on. It might be very difficult for us to do so. And then we come into this realm again of access level management. So Spark does the whole simple thing of actually receiving an OAuth access token. It's a very regular OAuth 2 flow. So you provide your grant type, username, password, and you get an access token back. Then you use this token to sign a payload, right? Nothing really uh, stunning, nothing really incredible happening there. But what you have to realize is you don't have to fiddle around with your own server that handles the connection to a device. There is nothing like a dynamic IP service that you have to involve. There is no domain that you have to register. So it's becoming incredibly easy to actually interact with this device and start creating really mesh networks of those devices. Every device has its own unique ID, and then you can start registering routes for that. So one of the examples would be, in my case, uh, just a very simple function, handler, that catches all the payloads that I get. That's uh, Arduino wiring. If you have ever written Arduino, you should be able to re realize what's happening over here. here. So you have the setup function where you register one of those uh, catchers. Then you have the loop where all the magic happens. And then you have your function that just really gets the payload and interacts with that. 
Now, I've actually built a POS device, a point of sale device, based on the uh, Spark and an LCD screen. Um, architecture really simple, based on Node.js, based on JavaScript, the Spark, and some soldering. And finally, this came out. It took me like two hours and some soldering to come up with a technology solution like this. So we suddenly actually use APIs like our payment stack for Node.js and can bring that to a store, to a coffee shop. It is incredibly easy nowadays because hardware can be prototyped. I know the cabling is really bad. <laughs> so transactions to be Spark are simple requests. As I said, you provide the device IDs, your payloads, and then you can obviously also interact with the device, read values, get callbacks, and so on. They support TCP sockets with SSE, server-side events, and that's fantastic. So we can suddenly actually approach the topic of IoT in a totally different level. It's not just happening in our local network. So if we deal with authentication, we have to think about actually coming up with a standard for this. And for a long time, people proclaimed OAuth being that one standard. But then we realized there are even more device factors that exist uh, that we have to deal with. And there are also more and more companies actually having a big interest in it. Sometimes devices are not connected to the internet and still need to be authenticated. So that's where the FIDO Alliance comes in, um, which is a big alliance of companies like Google, like Microsoft, PayPal, Lenovo, and they try to secure the internet. And they try to come up with new form factors. So if we look at the road ahead, I think it's quite clear. We come to a stage where connecting IoT and the APIs is becoming easier and easier because some of those IoT devices actually have an API already. So instead of fiddling around with uh, weird payloads, you actually just start by pushing one payload, one message, one piece of data over to another device. We don't really have to start knowing all the device details. We don't have to understand how all of them work. We just send around uh, details through APIs, so we can actually abstract away a lot of the hardware. Thank you. We have time for two questions. Not from me. <laughs> yeah, okay. I have the spotlight in the head. Uh, thanks. Um, talking about standards and web payments, uh, I look at the list of participants of a uh, web payments interest group hosted by World Worldwide Web Consortium. And there are people from Orange and AT&T and Deutsche Telekom and Yandex, Opera, Federal Banks of Reserves and so on. Do you know if uh, PayPal participates in some open web payments process? Maybe you have some insights on that. We do actually work on a bunch of different uh, committees and alliances for these topics. I'd be happy to discuss that afterwards. I'm not sure if that's one particular alliance we're part of, but obviously we work on standards as well. One more question? No, it's, no? A, photo, it's a photo on this side. Uh, uh, just a, a quick one uh, on Internet of Things. Um, you know, so, um, one un someone say that uh, now it's obvious that every device has to need power to, to work, right? And it, it's obvious we don't even ask if there is battery or something. It's obvious. Do you, how do you think it will be obvious that every object will have an Internet connection and will be connected? I think it's people like us in this room, the geeks, the developers, that are really keen to tap into all the devices and start using them and start connecting them, right? It's always the desire to create mashups between different experiences. So by having that, we, slowly, uh, we actually fairly soon realize that we can start marketing those things as new products again. If we look at the uh, fitness response, People used to run with a GPS-enabled watch for years already, right? And suddenly they actually communicate with my iPhone and show me leaderboards and so on. So it was a very natural movement. And I think exactly the same movement is going to happen with most of these smart devices and smart objects that we see, where it's becoming a standard to communicate and allow uh, gathering data. Because you want to know how uh, en energy efficient you are. You want to know how secure your home is. You want to know how distant something is. 
So it's becoming a very natural movement for us. And through this slowly becoming commodity, I think we just are going to approach a world where this is a standard anyway. So we'll not talk about connected device, but devices. Yeah, so I think we can sl just slash away connected. And we don't talk about smart devices anymore. We just assume device equals connected device. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank Cheers. you. Some applause for Tim.